If you're listening to this podcast, then chances are good you are a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious. And if that's true, then you're in luck. Because, once again, Mr. Ballin Podcast, Strange, Dark, and Mysterious Stories is available everywhere you get your podcasts. Each week on the Mr. Ballin Podcast, you'll hear new stories about inexplicable encounters, shocking disappearances, true crime cases, and everything in between. Like our recent episode titled White Dust. After a middle-aged couple fail to answer their daughter's messages and calls, the daughter drives the few hours to her parents' house to check on them, but after arriving and seeing both her parents' cars in the driveway, the daughter gets an uneasy feeling and just can't stomach going inside. To hear the rest of that story and hear hundreds more stories like it, follow Mr. Ballin Podcast on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Prime members can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Hi, I'm Stephanie Strange. Want to hear something scary? Hey, Strangelines. I hope you all had a great start to the new year. We are excited for 2024, and we're starting off right with a compilation, so enjoy. Ilaria was a God-fearing young woman from a strict Catholic family. She was to be wed to Salvador Cruz. Salvador had a reckless past with a penchant for tequila and the ladies. But now he went to church and had become the honest and caring man Eladia had prayed for. But old habits die hard. The night before the wedding, Salvador decided to visit his ex-girlfriend, Juana. While their relationship had been volatile and not good for either of them, the desire had not diminished. Juana plied him with his favorite tequila, and Salvador chose to momentarily forget Eladia. Salvador, selfish fool that he was, thought of this as closure, and he'd still enjoy his wedding in the morning. The next day, the bells rang out, but as the church doors opened, Eladia stood at the entrance, her father by her side, but the groom was nowhere to be found. Eladia looked around, frantically, asking for Salvador. Then the whisper started, for everyone else knew exactly where he was. Humiliated, embarrassed for being lied to and cheated on, and for not honoring the sanctity of the church, Eladia wasn't thinking clearly. She ran up the stairs toward the bell tower as fast as she could. At the highest point of the church, she looked up to the heavens and said, Forgive me, Father, for what I'm about to do. She closed her eyes and leapt to the ground, her neck snapping instantly. The wedding attendant stared in disbelief. The coroner came to remove the body, and the priest tried to calm the parishioners. Two hours after the wedding, a taxi sped up to the church. Salvador stumbled out, reeking of booze. He straightened his tie and slicked back his hair, trying to cover his sins. When he saw the coroner loading the body bag into the van, Salvador knew. The crowd turned on him, chasing him out of town, and he wasn't seen again for months. Until one day, Salvador started showing up at church again. Sober and looking to repent, the community forgave him. He even began volunteering at the church, staying to clean up after services. One evening, alone in the church, he saw a woman in white pass by. He turned to ask if she was okay, but she was gone. Just as he was about to lock up, he heard a noise by the stairs. Glancing over, he saw white fabric floating up the stairway. He followed. The white fabric continued up to the roof near the bell, but there was no one there. All he could see was a white wedding veil lying over the edge about to blow off. He ran up to it, snatching the lacy material. As he turned to head back downstairs, there she stood. The ghost of Eladia. Her neck snapped to the side. But she had become something else. The betrayal and grief of being left at the altar had created a vengeful spirit. La Novia da Tola. Before he could speak, she flew over, lifting him a foot off the ground. 
floating in midair, she whispered, Forgive me, Father, for what I'm about to do. She threw him over the ledge. His body fell, just as Hilarius had, except he didn't die instantly. He lay there, face down, writhing in pain, his legs broken, his arms shattered. Screaming in anguish, he felt Eladia hovering above him. He begged for her forgiveness. Eladia stomped on him, shattering the bones from his legs to his ribs to his pelvis. She rolled him over, looking him in the eye as he groaned. And with one final stomp, his face collapsed. The final breath left his body. By the time the townspeople found him, they mourned that Salvador's grief and regret had led him to commit suicide in the very place Eladia had. Because what should they believe otherwise? La Novia's legend led to statues and the Nicaraguan saying, left waiting like the bride from Tola. Hell hath no fury like a ghost scorn. There once was a couple, Daniel and Melinda, who seemed to be over the moon in love. One of the things that brought them together was their competitive nature. They liked to push each other to be the best versions of themselves. Of course, all the competitiveness was friendly and well-intentioned. It sometimes meant silly little games of tag here and there, or maybe some nights of hide and seek. They were both sort of adult children. After many years, they became engaged and were off to the races, competing with each other to see who could find the best venue for the best price. But there was one point of tension in their relationship. Daniel was incredibly jealous of Melinda's best friend from childhood, Angelica. He was convinced that this so-called friend was in love with his bride-to-be and she would try and sabotage the wedding by any means possible. Melinda always had to reassure him that he was overthinking things and that there was nothing to worry about. You have no reason to feel this way. Angelica is my oldest friend. Just tell me this, Daniel asked. Did you ever have feelings for her? Melinda paused. Yes, I have. But it was years ago, please, you have to understand. Daniel wasn't happy with this answer. You have to uninvite her. Are you crazy? She's in my bridal party. I can't uninvite her. I honestly don't know if I can handle seeing her there. It's our wedding day. It's supposed to be perfect. The couple stared at each other, both silently challenging the other to give in first. Melinda sighed. If that's what will make you happy, I'll talk to her. Months later, the day of the wedding arrived. The engaged couple had forgotten about their past arguments and were just happy that the day had come. Melinda ended up finding the best venue for the best price, her parents' large and lavish Victorian mansion. The ceremony was going to be held outside in the gorgeous gardens and the reception would take place inside. The guests were filing in and finding their seats while Melinda was hiding from sight near the end of the aisle. Suddenly, Daniel appeared next to her. Danny, you're not supposed to see She's me. here. Why is she here? You told me she wasn't going to come. Oh my God, she's sitting in the back. She's not in the bridal party anymore. You literally don't have to see or speak to her. Well, I did see her and I just can't believe you'd do this to me. Really? You're gonna do this right now? At this point, the couple's voices were rising, causing the guests to turn and look over at them. Hey. You know what will be fun? Why don't we play a game of hide and seek with all the guests? That always cheers you up. And afterwards, I can talk to Angelica again. Deal? Daniel exhaled. I'm so sorry. I know I'm being ridiculous. I know that. I know she's important to you and it's not fair of me to act this way. I love you. I love you too. Now let's play. I'll be it. The guests are all informed of the game of hide and seek before the ceremony, and they willingly participate. Melinda closed her eyes and began counting backwards from 30, and everyone scattered to find a hiding spot. The property was huge, so there was plenty of space. Ready or not, here I come! 
Melinda grew up in this house and knew every nook and cranny, so she had no problem finding everyone. Except for one person, the groom. So all the other guests began to help Melinda look for him. Melinda heard some people whispering that they thought Daniel might have gotten cold feet and ran away. After they searched the entire property, Melinda collapsed to the floor in tears. Angelica approached her. I know this isn't what you want to hear, but I think I saw Daniel running out the gates during the game. I mean, he could be coming back, but I don't know. I'm so sorry, Mel. The wedding was clearly no longer happening, so the guests returned to their cars and headed home, while Angelica continued to comfort the bride. You're my best friend, and I will always be here for you. Remember? She held out her pinky finger. Together forever? The bride smiled, wiped the tears from her eyes, and hooked her pinky onto Angelica's and said, no matter whatever. Years went by. Angelica and Melinda became closer than ever. Memories of old crushes resulted in casual dates, which led to a surprisingly fast engagement. The wedding venue? Melinda's parents' Victorian mansion. Melinda's parents felt a little strange that their daughter would want to plan a wedding at their home again, but they just wanted her to be happy. So Angelica, Melinda, and her parents began to clean out the manor. Melinda went upstairs to see if she could find some tablecloths and decor to use for the wedding. That's when she noticed a door. It wasn't there when she was a kid. Mom, was this door always here? Melinda shouted down the stairs to her mom, who replied, Oh, we added that room a couple years ago for extra storage. Melinda opened it to find a very messy and dusty room filled with boxes and furniture. In the middle of the room was a large antique trunk. There was a lock with the key still inside. Curious, she turned it and hoisted the heavy lid with both hands. Immediately, a putrid stench seeped out through the open crack. As new air flew in, old air came out. She dropped the lid on the side and covered her nose. She peered inside and her eyes went wide. The rotting corpse of a man, face stretched in anguish, lay battered and broken within the trunk. There were scratch marks highlighted with dried blood on the inside of the lid. The man's skin was leathery and stiff, just like the suit that hung across his gray flesh, the dusty and rumpled suit of Daniel. Melinda heard footsteps behind her. She turned around to find Angelica in the doorway. Angie, you said you saw him leave the property. You, you knew he was in here, didn't you? Angelica continued to stare, face devoid of all emotion. Angie, did you do this? We made a promise, Mel, and I wasn't going to let anyone get in between us. Don't you remember? She held out her pinky. Together forever, no matter whatever. Okiwara hadn't lived in Tokyo long, despite the fact that he lived in a very hectic city where sometimes it felt like he would be swallowed whole, he was grateful to have his neighbor, Ina. When Ogiwara first moved in, he was attacked with kisses by Ina's dog, Bento. In the face of this incident, Ina profusely apologized and said Bento had great intuition, taking a liking to Ogiwara, and said she knew he was trustworthy. As a result, their friendship was sealed. They would grab each other's mail, bring each other coffee, and even have late night drinks after work. When it was dark out, he would go with Ina to take Bento out for walks just so she wouldn't be alone. Ina couldn't help it. She was falling for Ogiwara. One dark, cold night while they were walking Bento, he began acting squirrely. He was pulling on the leash, barking at nothing, and couldn't be calmed. Even heading back towards the apartment, Bento was growling. As an unexpected flashlight blinded them, Ogiwara instinctively placed himself in front of Ina. Who's there? He called out over Bento's barking. In response, the person lowered their flashlight. A stunning woman stood before them, illuminated by the moon, who was unlike anything either of them had ever seen before. 
Her hair was long and voluminous, and her eyes were piercing. She said she was lost and needed help finding her Airbnb. And in addition, she mentioned her reason to coming into town was to perform some singing gigs. Bento was losing it. He was down in attack position, growling under his breath. Even the alley cat that slinked by sneered at the woman. Ina apologized and said she had to take Bento inside. Ogiwara told her to go on without him. He was going to stay and help the woman find her Airbnb. It's Dora, said the woman holding out her hand to introduce herself. Over the next few weeks, Ina saw less of Ogiwara. She was heartbroken as she watched Ogiwara drift away, devoted to his new girlfriend, Dora, who had become so obsessed with. Ina was collecting her mail late one night when she noticed Ogiwara's mailbox was stuffed full. She had carried his mail with trembling hands, all too aware of who might be lurking at his place. Before she rang the bell, she peeked in to see if she was there. If she was, Ina would just leave it for him. The last person she wanted to see was Dora. And her heart sank when she saw Dora's heels by the door. She cautiously observed the scene before her. Ogiwa rested peacefully, but a spine-chilling sight caught her eye. An ominous bone cradling him from behind. As she narrowed in for further inspection, it became clear that this was no ordinary skeleton. Its gaping sockets served as silent reminders of who used to inhabit them. Dora's once piercing eyes now replaced them with dead silence. Horrified, she ran back to her apartment. She was too scared to sleep. She had seen Dora walk past and thought she would finally catch a break from the danger outside. But then came an unexpected loud bang on the door. Bento jumped into high alert, barking at the monster on the other side. You won't take him from me, Dora sneered. He is mine, she declared before leaving. Once Bento calmed down, Ina went straight for Ogiwara's apartment. Despite her tears, she was happy to see that he was alive and doing well. He had no clue what she was talking about. Ina explained what she saw the night before. She claimed Dora was a Botandoro, a Japanese spirit of subduction. She will kill you and take you to her grave with her songs, she told him. But Ogiwara scoffed at the idea. He said Ina was just jealous. He felt bad for not spending as much time with her, but this accusation was just pathetic. He then closed the door in Ina's face. Insulted and hurt, Ina tried not to think about Ogiwara and avoided him at all costs. As a result of this, she began wearing earbuds so she wouldn't hear Dora's stupid singing. Maybe she was just imagining these things, she thought to herself. Love can make you do and see crazy things. She went on like that until one night, a chill ran down her spine as Bento's howls pierced through their small apartment. She took out her earbuds and what she saw outside made her heart stop for a moment. The police swarmed around Ogiwara's place. Did it finally happen? Had she been right about Dora? It turns out that Ogiwara's lifeless body had been discovered in a mysterious cemetery, embraced by the bony clutches of an aged corpse, that of Dora, who had been dead for over 80 years. Thanks so much for listening. Like and share if this video gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. See you next time.